So, hi there, my name is Rebecca Slater and I'm based at the University of Oxford and I'm Associate Professor of Pediatric Neuroimaging. And for the last, I don't know, I keep saying 10 years, but it's probably 15 now, I've been looking at the development of pain in the newborn infant. So, the talk I'm going to give you to you today is about pain in the newborn, how we can measure it, and how we can hopefully improve the treatment of infant pain. So, much of the challenge associated with the measurement of pain in the infant is clearly the inability for them to communicate um, verbally. Obviously, if an adult was in pain, they would just describe it. They could say how painful something is in terms of its intensity. They can describe the location of the pain. And they could also say whether analgesics are working. Now, obviously, an infant cannot do that. So we have to rely on other ways to measure pain in this population. And this is really important because pain has long-term negative consequences, but yet it's still really undertreated in the infant population. Um, estimates suggest of kind of procedures, routine procedures that um, uh, clinicians or um, care providers would consider to be painful, only around 35% are given um, pain treatment. And this usually includes <coughs> non-pharmacological treatment, such as swaddling the babies and um, non-nutritive sucking, for example. And given that the infants who are admitted to intensive care experience a high number of painful procedures a day, it's thought the estimates are around sort of 10 to 12 procedures. Um, and on average, these children might stay in intensive care for sort of 50 days or so. This is a huge amount of nociceptive information that's being transmitted to the brain during their early development, which really does have the potential to change the way we process pain in the future, and also it's important to minimise it just in terms of the direct well-being of the baby at the time. So, how do we quantify pain in an infant? Well, primarily, um, the main thing that we do is look at um, facial expressions and a number of features have been identified that are thought to um, correspond to whether or not a baby is experiencing pain. And I've identified a few of them on this slide. You can see classic brow bulge, um, nasolabial furrows, and eye squeezers. And often these are used to form the basis of most clinical pain assessment tools. And these were really important because they rebutted the historical misconception that infants don't feel pain that was prevalent in the 1980s and also led to a huge change in the way, um, in the awareness of pain in the newborn infant. And consequently, based on these measures, as well as other parameters such as physiological changes, such as increases in heart rate and drops in oxygen saturation, they form the basis of most clinical pain assessment tools and there are about 50 or so of these tools that have been developed, which have been highly important in raising awareness of pain. But what are the challenges associated with these measures? Well, they started all to be used to test the analgesic efficacy of a range of pharmacological treatments, such as morphine, paracetamol, and topical local anaesthetic, across a whole range of clinical procedures, such as lumbar punctures, injections, blood sampling, and um, eye exams. And what, has led, what this has led to is some really inconsistencies in whether these drugs work. And in Cochrane reviews and meta-analyses looking at all of these drugs, they conclude that there's insufficient evidence to recommend their, their use for pain relief. Now, I would argue that some of the reasons that all of these drugs have been shown to be ineffective is because the measures we are using are simply not sensitive enough or specific enough in order to measure the pain. So obviously, changes in facial expression will also happen if the baby is hungry or other kind of similar um, procedures. And so therefore, you can't necessarily totally rely on these facial expressions to test analgesic efficacy <coughs> in, for example, clinical trials. So what can we do about it? Well, we don't just need to rely on any single parameter, but we want to take a multi-dimensional approach to the assessment of pain. So we can look at reflex activity using EMG electrodes. In animal studies, we know that the amount you reflex is really highly correlated with the intensity of a nociceptive input. We can also look at these heart rate changes that I described earlier, and oxygen saturation. Facial degrimacing is really important. But my particular area of interest is looking at noxious evoked brain activity. And the reason why I'm going to focus on this is pain is an experience that happens in the brain. 
So in the absence of language, if we wanted to try and find the best measure to try and understand the pain experience, then I would argue that looking at pain-related brain activity might be most closely aligned to that, um, to that experience. And I'm also very interested in physiological instability, and this is something that I'll come back to later, because we started doing 48-hour recordings pre and post retinopathy of prematurity eye exams to look at the number of apneas or bradycardias or tachycardic events that happen. And what you'll see is that the event, these event rates are really increased way beyond the levels that I was expecting to see. So I'm going to focus on looking at um, brain activity. And so where did this journey start? Oh no, one more thing, just to make sure you're all concentrating. Um, using, using facial expression in adults is also a problem. So you can see here, um, this guy has all of the features that we um, demonstrated, and this was when he won the Rugby World Cup. <laughs> so clearly, if we were like, relying on these facial features here, then um, you know, Martin Johnson wouldn't have been interpreted as celebrating as he did. Anyway, um, so, looking at noxious evoked brain activity in the infant, the first studies were done um, about 10 years ago now by us and a group run by Hugo Lovecraft as well, where we looked at near-infrared spectroscopy. So this is looking at changes in the haemoglobin in the, in the brain. And what we were able to see is in, when you look at these responses, in following a clinical procedure, in the case, in my case I looked at um, looking at clinical heel lancing, which is the stimulus I'm going to use in the majority of the work that I'm going to present to you today, you're able to see there's a clear and significant increase in the activity on the contralateral somatosensory cortex, which would be expected in the adult. If you were to stimulate the left leg, then it would be the contralateral side that you would um, be able to see the maximum change in activity. But not only are we interested in the um, haemoglobin change, we're also interested in the underlying electrical activity. Yeah. Obviously, if there's a high energy demand in a particular brain region, then um, the neurons are firing, which causes a change in the um, electric field, which you can measure with EEG, and then through neurovascular coupling, this is driving the change in the blood flow and hemodynamics that we can see with near infrared. And so when you do a similar procedure where you put an array of EEG electrodes over the head and you look at the response to the clinical heel lance, what you can see is that around 500 milliseconds there's a large deflection that we only seem to see when the infant's having a painful experience. So we don't see it in response to other tactile events. We do, however, see this early potential at around 200 milliseconds, which seems to be non-specific activity and probably to do with arousal. So, um, so what we think we've got here is this nociceptive specific pattern of brain activity. So what have we done with these measures? And I'm just going to give you a highlight of a few of the papers and work that we've done on trying to understand and interpret this measure. Well, one piece of work we've quite recently done is we applied equally arousing visual, tactile, and auditory stimuli to the baby, as well as this noxious event. And by equally arousing, I mean that these caused a change in heart rate that was equivalent to that which you would have seen um, following the noxious procedure. And then we quantified this pattern of activity using a template that you can see here. And you can see that we only saw the noxious about brain activity in response to the noxious event. And importantly, when we applied local anaesthetic to the surface of the skin prior to measuring this response, it significantly reduced the amount of activity, suggesting that the topical local anaesthetic was indeed effective. Now this is interesting because many reports suggest that topical local anaesthetic <coughs> is not effective in the newborn infant based on behavioural measures. And we also observed this. But what I believe this is, is the infant was still quite distressed by the experience. They were still going in, this was a jaundice clinic where they were coming in for um, blood sampling. They were still taken from their mum, they were still being physically restrained in order to put the cannula in. And so the babies were still distressed, but the actual amount of nociceptive information going to the brain was reduced. And indeed, the reflex withdrawal activity um, from these um, responses was reduced suggesting that there's a real dissociation between nociception and distress. Now, both of these things are equally important, and it's not to say that we want to um, try and eliminate one without the other, but we definitely don't want to be in a position where you're potentially getting rid of the distress and not actually reducing the nociceptive activity. 
because this is something in animal models has been shown to be driving the long-term developmental consequences that can be seen. So what else can I tell you about this measure? Well, if you look at the size of it, as I said, it correlates really well with the reflex withdrawal. And this is important because this is something that you can visually see in these infants, can look at how much their leg withdraws. And in fact, the more intense the painful procedure, the more likely you are to see a bilateral limb withdrawal. Because infants have a very poor ability to localise stimulation site. So if you touch different areas of their body, they're not very good at identifying exactly where it is, and they'll withdraw with both their, their legs. As they mature, this um, reflex becomes more refined, and you just withdraw with one leg. And indeed, in adults, if we were touched, we wouldn't withdraw at all. So there's a refinement way beyond the early developmental period, right into um, later um, adolescence, where this, these reflexes become more and more refined. So importantly, the one thing we want to know is how well these measures of brain activity relate to the clinical pain scores that we'd all be using in standard clinical practice. And so here you can see, if you look at the increase in the pain score, it's broadly pretty well correlated with the magnitude of the brain activity. Now this is important because it says that we're kind of, you know, these pain scores are doing a pretty good job. But a really important observation came out of this study. And what it was is that in about 40% of the infants, they didn't show a change in behavioural response which is pretty consistent if across the literature. If you were to do a heel lance in a baby, lots of these babies don't respond. It's particularly interesting to me to try and answer, answer that question as to why. But when you look at these, these babies where they didn't have the behavioural response, most of them still showed a significant increase in the brain activity. So again, this suggests if you were looking at behaviour alone, these babies might be interpreted as being pain-free, where <coughs> actually the nociceptive information is still being transmitted to the brain. And an example where I think this is really important is in neonatal sepsis. So these babies are particularly lethargic. They're much less likely to mount a sustained behavioural response to a, a blood test, for example. And so you'd be more likely to give them a lower pain score. But actually, inflammation in adults, or at least raised CRP levels, is um, associated with increased pain sensitivity and reduced pain tolerance. And when we've looked at these septic babies, there's a real dissociation between the behaviour and the brain activity, suggesting in perhaps some of the sickest babies, which are the ones that are going to be most frequently given these kind of painful procedures, that we're even less likely to be able to rely on just using behavioural measures. <coughs> And so, finally, I want to say that these measures are suitable for use in clinical trials. So at the moment, they're not developed so that we can test every baby and put an electrode on their head and work out whether or not they're in pain. And the reason we can't do that is the EEG measures that we've been developing are also not sensitive and specific enough to achieve that. So actually, um, there's only a 60% specificity and sensitivity for a baby, an individual baby, as to whether they would define someone as having been pain or pain free. However, where they are really useful and where they have been developed is for studying population differences. For example, in a randomised control trial where you might give drug A to the first group and a placebo to the second group. And then when you have these population differences, they are able to discriminate between the different um, measures. So in this case, this is an example of a trial that was done some time ago now, back in 2010, where we looked at whether the noxious about brain activity, reflex withdrawal activity, and the behavioural responses were reduced by sucrose. And what we found here is that there was no difference in the nociceptive information that was transmitted to the brain in the infants who were given sucrose prior to a heel lance and those that were given sterile water. This was also true when we looked at the reflex activity, but it wasn't the case for the behavioural expressions, as you would expect, because there are more than 100 randomised control trials showing that sucrose is effective um, at diminishing um, behavioural responses to pain. So again, there's the demonstration of a dissociation between the behavioural responses and the pain activity. But this study would argue that the sucrose isn't actually reducing the nociceptive information that's being transmitted to the brain, but rather just altering the behavioural manifestations. <coughs> so, 
what are these responses telling us? At the moment, I've been characterizing a small pattern of EEG activity within 100,000 milliseconds of a stimulus. What's generating these responses? So in order to do that, we took some inputs to the fMRI scanner, and we started looking at the spatial pattern of brain activity that was driving these responses. And in this case, we actually used a very mild experimental pinprick stimulation. And this was at a level where we didn't get any behavioural change or physiological change. And actually that would be a requirement for an fMRI study because the babies have to lie very still. So if they were um, very active in response to the stimuli, we wouldn't have been able to do the study. But using these low intensity pinprick stimuli, what we were able to see is that the pattern of brain activity in the infant was remarkably similar to that in the adult and included not only sensory areas, such as the somatosensory cortex, um, but also areas that are associated with the effective processing of pain, such as the anterior cingulate cortex that you can see here in blue. And this suggests that some of the neural circuitry is in place in these infants for them not only to be able to identify um, the, like the, the basic um, sensory aspects of the stimuli, but also to potentially assign a negative valence to the, um, to the actual nociceptive input. So suggesting they can also have the more emotional aspects of this experience. Now, we can never know whether somebody else is in pain if they can't tell us. So all of these measures are based on an inferences, or based on inferences from what we know in the adult. The adult described these stimuli as painful, and this is the pattern of activity that we can see in their brains. And in the infants, we saw something very similar. And so this suggests that the brain was um, more developed than we may have expected. But not only was it more developed, and I don't think this is going to surprise anyone in this audience, but actually, the infants seemed to have a much heightened sensitivity to the nociceptive input. So when we applied the same intensity stimuli to the adult and the baby, what you could see is much more activity in the infant than the adult. In fact, um, it was around, it, in order to, for the adult to get the same level of intensity stimulus, you needed to increase the um, force that was being applied by about four times. So it really shows that kind of all this historical mis, um, misunderstanding about infants not feeling pain is really very unlikely, and actually they are probably more sensitive than the adults. <coughs> so one of the questions is, um, can we understand what's driving these responses? And this is just some new work which I'm just going to highlight here, suggesting that what we can now do is actually look at the underlying um, structural pathway development which might drive these patterns of activity. So, interestingly, the infant activity is much more bilateral than the adult. You see it on both sides of the brain, whereas an adult, there's a real contralateral dominance. And this could be because in the infant, you've got all of these immature pathways that are crossing um, the hemispheres through the corpus callosum. Now, the majority of these pathways are eliminated within, within the first postnatal month. And there's suggestions that the number of axons in a turn age is around four times as many as in the adult. So once these pathways retract, are we getting a more localised response to the stimuli? Equally, is it that the infant has a very immature information process? In the adult, we have this dominant um, activity going through the contralateral side. But maybe in the infants, the, inf the information is going up from the thalamocortical pathways on both sides of the brain. And this is something we can start to address by looking at structural pathway development and functional connectivity, which suggests how well the different regions of the brain are talking to each other. Um, early pilot data in this actually suggests it's the interhemispheric pathways that's driving this um, bilateral activity and might help us explain some of the human behaviour. Is this why the infants are not able to localise so well? Is it why when you do something on one side, you don't get a defensive unilateral limb withdrawal, but rather you get both feet withdrawing at the same time? As these pathways mature, are we more likely to see more refined behavioural activity? Okay. So, much of what I've been telling you so far has been about the, um, at the term brain, but we're also interested in the period of prematurity. And so these are some amazing 3D prints of brains of babies that have been in the MRI scanner. And just for those that wanted to play my game, um, there's the answer. But the real point of this slide is showing the, the huge structural development between a 29-week infant 
up to adulthood and through um, the period of prematurity. So how does this alter how we respond to no susceptive impact? Well, if you take an infant who's 28 weeks and then look at them in throughout their gestation up until their term and you do something painful to them, what you primarily get nearly 100% of the time is what we call a delta brush. This is a generalised burst of neuronal activity that you'd also see in the background activity, but um, you can also evoke it. However, you also can see these nociceptive patterns of activity that I've described. But at 28 weeks, they're very rarely there, less than 20% of the time, and then they increase to um, around 80%. And it's pretty amazing that it's not until around 34 weeks gestation that the infant's more likely to have this nociceptive specific response to this generalised burst of activity that can be seen in response to any kind of stimulation. And when, I, when I initially saw this, I thought, that's really quite late in development. I would have expected it to be earlier. But for an infant in utero, why would they need to discriminate between pain and touch? It's not something that's developmentally very valuable in the normal utero environment. So perhaps... Um, that makes sense in terms of it being a relatively late um, perception that, we, that emerges. So what happens um, during this period of development? Well, the brain activity <coughs> matures. You see an increase in the magnitude of this noxious like brain activity. And at the same time, you see a decrease in the reflex limb withdrawal activity. So you're getting a more localised and refined response. And so this is summarised in this diagram here, where you can see that the maturation of the infant leads to um, this increased brain maturation, leads to this decreased um, withdrawal response, which might suggest the beginning of descending inhibitory controls, because there's now a clear link <coughs> between the pattern of brain activity and our behavioural movements. So, one of the things I wanted to address today is how we can potentially try and improve the treatment of pain in infants. And what we're doing now is a um, clinical trial um, in 156 babies who are having um, a retinopathy of prematurity eye screen. And the reason is all the Cochrane reviews will say that the current treatment strategy, which is primarily putting topical local anaesthetic into the eye, is ineffective. And this is, this is very, really true. In our pilot data, we would look at the babies who are having this procedure in the period before and after the exam, and we saw a huge increase in the number of episodes of sustained oxygen desaturations. That's actually shown here. These markers here are each time this baby had an oxygen desaturation. You can also see the baby was tachycardic, um, where the heartbeat was went over 200 beats a minute. And then these ones are showing you the periods of bradycardia, which is a two-fold increase. Um, from the pre-stimulus baseline. So treating pain during these procedures may um, not only be important for the actual time of the procedure, but actually improve the physiological stability of these babies for an entire day after the event. So we're looking at the reflex activity, we're also looking at the um, patterns of brain activity, the heart rate and oxygen saturation. And what we want to see, whether um, this um, a small um, oral bolus dose of morphine, if it's titrated to the intensity of the pain during this procedure, it can actually increase physiological stability. Well, we've currently studied 14 participants, and so we'll be able to tell you the results of that trial, um, hopefully um, next year. Um, but this is just an example of how we can start to try and use these methods to get a more sensitive way of testing um, whether analgesics work. So I was writing a review the other day, and I was tapping away, you know, um, pain is still undertreated in the infants. And I thought, I'd better check this, because I've been saying the same thing for the last 15 years. And so I just went onto the UK NHS Choices website, which is our national um, voice for the NHS, our public voice. And it said, in small babies, being cuddled and fed are more important than painkillers, whereas a general anaesthetic is usually needed for older babies for tongue-tie surgery. I looked at this in 2015, and then it's now been updated. It was now updated in 2016. So these kind of things are still prevalent in the, in the literature, suggesting that we, sh that, you know, that pain relief isn't the primary thing that's needed for these kind of procedures. And I'd strongly argue that that's not the case. There's no evidence for this. And in fact, at three months old, if a baby was having tongue tie surgery, they would be given a general anaesthetic. And I don't think that's because there's great evidence that the maturation of the brain has changed at three months old, but more, it becomes very difficult to physically restrain a three-month-old infant compared to a newborn. 
So on that note, I just want to thank everyone that's been involved in this kind of work. Um, there's a huge team needed to be able to do these things, from neonatologists to engineers to neuroscientists, and they're all named here. Thank you.